I trust that it will not be a weariness to the friends who were with us earlier if I go right through those passages of the Word which we had as our foundation, but it seems necessary in view of there being quite a number here who have not been earlier. And, in any case, we must have a good foundation in the Word, and I think in bringing these portions together, they themselves constitute a vision of divine purpose and thought. So, we'll get on with it and turn to our overall fragment in the prophecies of Jeremiah, chapter 17, at verse 12, a glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. And then, in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 8, Of the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever the scepter of uprightness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The second psalm, the second psalm, and verse 8, Ask of me, and I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Book of the Acts, chapter 1, and verse 8. Ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Ye shall be my witnesses unto the uttermost part of the earth. Back to Jeremiah, to chapter 1. And verse 4, word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth, I sanctified thee. I have appointed thee a prophet unto the nation. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. The Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For to whomsoever I shall send thee, thou shalt go, and whatsoever I shall command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid because of them, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms 
to pluck up and to break down and to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And finally, the letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 1, first part of verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in him unto a dispensation of the fullness of the times to sum up all things in Christ, things in the heavens, things upon the earth, in him, I say. And this afternoon, we are going to move from the wider circumference to the more inward application. What is before us, we believe, by the Lord's appointing is the great, wonderful truth and reality that the call which has come to us and to the people of God contains a very great purpose. It would not be surprising if a failure to know and to apprehend the great purpose of God through salvation resulted in a number of disappointing conditions. Because, as I think we shall see as we go on, the real fullness of the meaning of Christ to the believer lies right there in the purpose for which he has brought them into fellowship with himself. It does not lie In their just, and this is not, of course, uh, minimizing or undervaluing salvation in its initial and elementary phases, but it does not all lie there, only potentially and intentionally. You, as you know, perhaps very well, perhaps too well, can be saved and stay there for the rest of your life, rejoicing in the fact what that means, but knowing painfully little of all the great inheritance 
that is in Christ. And that ignorance resulting in such limitation in life is due to this. Not to ignorance of the way of salvation, but to ignorance as to the purpose of salvation. And the purpose now, as well as in the ages to come. So that the emphasis at this time is upon that for which we are saved, unto which we have been called in Christ Jesus. And although it will be said again and again, let us say it here now, that purpose is not only to have and not only to be, but it is to fulfill a vocation. All the having and all the being is unto a great service to the Lord. Now we spent the whole morning on that and sorry as we may be for those who didn't get it we have to go on. We want to get, as I have said, right on the inside of this matter this afternoon as the Lord will help us. You will have probably been aware that so much of what we read in other places is very much, if not altogether, of a piece with what we read in Jeremiah. There you have the throne on high from the beginning, a glorious throne. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and of the sun, he said it. The throne as something relating to the nations, to the uttermost part of the earth. Jeremiah was told that he was appointed a prophet to the nations, to the nations, not only to the nation, but to the nations. And the fulfillment of his tremendous Tremendous in range and tremendous in cost. His tremendous ministry and vocation was only possible with that throne in view as his place of refuge and appeal and resource. To the Lord Jesus, the Father is heard saying, Lord, my Son, this day have I begotten thee, ask of me. I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That Son later said to the nucleus of the church with the whole church in view, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, unto the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, you are related to the Father's intention to give me the nations for mine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for my possession. That's your business. That's your commission. That's your vocation. Having made known unto us the mystery, the secret of his will to regather 
all things into Christ. He's made that known to us. Why? Because he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. In piecing it all together, it makes one picture and comes right up to this, the purpose for which we have been brought into fellowship with God's Son. It is, to repeat a phrase we've used many times, a vocational fellowship with God's Son. Now then, to come to this matter and to allow Jeremiah in his experience, in his function, to interpret for us, because it's all one thing. Whether it's Old Testament or New, it's one purpose. And it's one way of God. Jeremiah can help us a lot as a focus of all that we have said. As we take up then these verses right at the beginning of his life and work, we are in the presence of God acting sovereignly in relation to his purpose. What a tremendous thing this book of Jeremiah discloses as to the sovereign activities of God. It is God acting in his own right. God acting on his own initiative. God himself the originator and projector of everything. It is God taking things in hand personally and bringing them out of his own counsels, the counsel of his own will. And this book of Jeremiah is full of the fact and then of the features of this sovereign movement and action of God in relation to purpose. Dear friends, the language may sound technical, even theological. If you can get through the language, the very word sovereignty is a word that has been taken up and made a basis of tremendous controversy. You can get through the words the phrases, to the truth that lies behind, you have, we have, an impregnable rock, an unshakable rock of confidence. The Lord is many times in the scriptures called the rock. The psalmist and that is a favorite title for the Lord. And we need something rock-like upon which to stand and to rest. And Jeremiah needed a rock under his feet. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the prophecies of Jeremiah. Perhaps you have not studied them very much. Perhaps you think that they're not particularly interesting or inspiring, perhaps a bit depressing. But those of you who know, know this, that if ever a man needed a rock under his feet, Jeremiah did. All the forces that he encountered that broke upon him. Jeremiah would not have survived at all 
let alone at last triumphed with his ministry but for a rock under his feet. And that which was of the nature of a rock was this, this. It's all in one word repeated how many times? Underline it in your Bible. I, I, before, before, thou camest forth, I knew thee. I formed thee. I have made thee a prophet to the nation. I have put my word in thy mouth. I knew thee. I formed thee. I chose thee. I appointed thee. I equip thee. I put my word in thy mouth. I. If Jeremiah had started this business, he wouldn't have got very far. If someone else had put him into it, he would have had good reason for a controversy with them and to retire very early in life. But he went through and for 40, 45 years of unceasing and ever growing antagonism and hostility Suffering, few men have known or suppose. He went through, and I believe that it was because of this, that underneath him and behind him was this which remained. I did not put myself into this. I did not take this work on. This was not my idea for my life. I really had nothing to do with it. Indeed, if I could have escaped it, I would. But I came under a divine compulsion. I am where I am. I am doing what I am. I am what I am. Because God said, I knew thee formed thee, appointed thee, sent thee, God. The divine sovereignty in action. You say that's all right, it's quite obvious for Jeremiah, we accept it for him. Now, does the letter to the Ephesians apply Jeremiah? To the Apostle Paul, or to some special servants of the Lord, or is it the message to the church? If it is the message to the church, as it surely is, it almost begins with this, he chose us. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I wonder how, how you define and explain your conversion. How do you put it when you refer to your, whatever it was, coming to the Lord, coming to know the Lord? I was saved on such and such a day. I came to know the Lord such and such a time. 
I was born again. Oh, we have many ways of putting it. I wonder how you put it. Do you know, dear friends, that the true way, all these, of course, are true in their way, but the truly adequate way to explain it is this, right back from eternity past, before this world was, a hand reached out to my lifetime and took hold of me. And in so doing, brought me right into something that was in the mind of God before the world was created. That's the meaning of our salvation. It is not just something that happens someday in our lifetime. There is concentrated into every true new birth from above all the meaning and intention of God's great purpose concerning his Son that he shall give to his Son the nations for his inheritance the uttermost part of the earth for his possession. That's in our being, Christians, our being, the Lord's. It's all there. And if all who are born again or saved, call it what you may, could only get something, something of that into their hearts and into their understanding, Ending early on at the beginning, don't you think that their spiritual progress would be much more rapid? That their measure as Christians would be much more greater? Much greater? There it is. Say, well, say and say so long ago and today not much more than when it happened why? for this very reason an insufficient apprehension of the greatness of the purpose bound up with salvation that's it dear our being here this afternoon in this room as born from above children of God has right in it this and no lesser meaning than this that we have been reached unto from eternity to be brought into that fellowship with God's Son for the ultimate possession of the nations and the regathering of all things into him. Now, of course, we must ever keep in view the relative factor in all that cannot, in the very nature of it, quite obviously, all that cannot be gathered into any one individual or into any number of individuals as separate individuals and entities. We are a part of a great whole. It is the church that is the elect, the chosen vessel for that purpose. But having said that, we can go on. Now you see, there are a number of things, a large number of things and great things that go with that. To which we have no right, to which we can make no claim, only as we get right into line with God's purpose concerning his son in fullness and stay there. 
now what do we mean? Well, look again at Jeremiah as instancing this. When God becomes possessed of a vessel, an instrument, for this purpose of his heart, this counsel of his will, this secret, what is translated, this mystery among the nations. When God gets hold of a people <coughs> in line with that, to that vessel and instrument, he commits himself. That's the next thing. God acts. And then, getting the response to his sovereign action, he commits himself to that vessel, to that instrument. And Jeremiah is a, a wonderful example of an instrument or a vessel to which God committed himself. Go away and read through again. Sure you'll want to, but you'll have to. <coughs> read through again. And see how many times it looked as though Jeremiah was finished. Finished by the design and the cruelty, the hostility, and the wickedness of men. Finished by the weariness, the awful weariness of his own hard way. Finished by the drooping of his own soul. I said I will no more speak. Then, go through, again and again, for reasons within himself and outside of himself, looks as though Jeremiah's finished. At last you reach that terrible time when the vehement wrath, fury against him has taken him and dropped him down into a deep, dark, muddy pit in which he sinks up to his arms to be left to starve and die. Finish? Well, it's finished now. Who can survive all this? The accumulation of things and this. But he survived. He survived. Came up out of the pit and went on for quite a long time with his work. And even when his prophecies being fulfilled, they came and destroyed Jerusalem. Came up out of the pit and went on for quite a long time with his work. And even when his prophecies being fulfilled, they came and destroyed Jerusalem carried away all who had opposed the very, very king himself who was doing it all, marked out Jeremiah to be saved, set him free, told him he could go where he liked. God 
in committing himself to this vessel, saw to it that he continued as long as he wanted him to continue. Let all the forces, men and devils, and all the human weaknesses and readiness to give up seem to say it's impossible to go on. You'll never get through. When God commits himself, there is continuance until God says, I'm finished. That's what it means. Oh, it's a tremendous thing, dear friends, to be right in line with God's purpose. God will commit himself to that. And there'll be continuance until God writes the day of finish on that story. That's the sovereign continuance of God. Well, you have that so much in the Bible. Many ways. Of course, that is the explanation of that symbol in the life of Moses. The bush that did not burn and was not consumed. That did burn and was not consumed. Lord knew what he was doing when he made that the medium of his call and commission to Moses. If ever a man, if ever a man found within himself and in those about him reason to again and again give it all up, say, I just can't go on anymore. Indeed, he did cry out sometimes, Oh Lord, I cannot bear this people. I cannot. But he did until God buried him. Till God fixed the day for his going. He went through all the weariness and all the welter and all the trouble. Because God was in the bush. Had committed himself. The unquenchable fire until God's work is done. Well, I dare not pick up the Bible along that line, but you can see, there it is. And what am I saying? I'm saying to you, that if you, if you come right into line with God's purpose, wholly committed to God's purpose, concerning his Son, And keep there. You'll go through. You may have all that Jeremiah had. If not literally, spiritually, you'll go through. It's a wonderful, wonderful story of the continuance. The continuance of a vessel to which God has committed himself. Get out of line with God's full purpose onto some subsidiary line, some bypass, some other track, some alternative, and this will not obtain. It will not obtain. Here is God's sovereignty then seen in Jeremiah in the matter of his continuance and in the matter of many particular deliverances. Many particular deliverances. Again and again God stepped right in at the critical moment and cut short because that was threatening the life of this man. And then when all was done, the final vindication, Jeremiah. Much has been made, and it's a gloomy side, side that none of us like to contemplate. Much has been made of the fact that Jeremiah was called to a ministry that was never going to succeed. 
call the people of God back to him. And it was destined to failure, in a sense. They never did. They never did come back. In a, in a sense, it looked as though he was giving his whole life to a lost cause. Oh well, for the time being, that is how it appears. And perhaps that is how it is. But don't forget, the return of the remnant from the judgment in captivity was definitely put on record written in the chronicles of the history of Israel written most probably by a man who was in it Ezra who wrote the chronicles the books of the Chronicles. Ezra the scribe. It was put there right at the beginning of the Chronicles of Israel. Israel that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. O oh, Cyrus, pagan king, great, good, noble, but ignorant of God, Rizar said, I have surnamed thee, although thou hast not known me. One day felt himself strangely moved within to think about these people that he got in his dominion, these Hebrews, and to look into their history and their case. Not to just let this thing drag on, but to see if something shouldn't be done about it. And this came on him. This came on him. He couldn't get away from it. Perhaps it became almost an obsession. Day and night, this matter was disturbing his rest and engaging his attention and causing him to look into it. The Spirit of God was doing what? Taking up the ministry of Jeremiah and making Cyrus fulfill it. Vindicating Jeremiah you want to know what lies behind that remnant coming back and the rebuilding of the house and of the wall and all those final activities of recovery? The answer is Jeremiah. Jeremiah? Isn't this sovereignty? Jeremiah wasn't on the scene here on earth to see it. I don't know whether he was watching it all from heaven. Whether or not he will know all about it. That his labor was not in vain in the Lord. God was committed to him. And there was an ultimate vindication of Jeremiah. Well, there may be a good deal of adversity Maybe a lot of time taken. Maybe much suffering and cost. But a vessel that is right in line with God's purpose concerning his son will stand vindicated at last. At last vindicated. God Almighty has committed himself to that and will see to it. Isn't that a rock to stand upon? Is, isn't it? The sovereignty of God committed. Well, what is the essential basis of this whole thing? This position? You see, it's just this fellowship with God in a purpose much larger than just a personal ministry 
or a personal bit of work for God. It is to see everything in the light of the whole. And to be committed, as Jeremiah was, without consideration of what is personal. Committed to what God wants. To what is nearest to the heart of God. It is fellowship with God in that which he has projected and is pursuing and is set upon realizing. Fellowship with God. Oh, our silly, silly little Christian interest. How foolish paltry so much. You look at people strutting about calling themselves by important names and uh, well I'd better stop playing at churches and chapels those are silly get some conception of the greatness of what God is after all that is so small and little our bit is only at most a fragment get right into the whole thing right into the whole thing firstly fellowship with the purpose of God and then and then fellowship with the burden and suffering of God the sufferings of Jeremiah seem to be very personal very much because of himself but nay they were the sufferings of God it was like that with the prophets wasn't it with the prophets they had been baptized into the passion of God concerning his great purpose in the nation and oh how they were baptized into that passion so many of their experiences the happenings in their lives were just sovereignly brought about call them tragedies if you like brought about in order to be vivid oh such vivid illustrations of what God was suffering a week or so ago we spent an evening here on the 30 pieces of silver for which Judas bargained with the high priests the life of the Lord Jesus. And we allowed that to take us back to the Old Testament where in three places 30 pieces of silver are mentioned. And one of them the prophecies of Hosea. Let me recount this in order to make this point particularly. Hosea, a young man, married a young, beautiful woman. They set up home. They lived together happily and in fellowship. Blessed fellowship. He went about his work and she kept the home. But after a time she tired of that life and tired of him. Some reason, perhaps if we said she got tired of his ministry. Didn't like the kind of ministry. It wasn't very popular. 
didn't bring many friends. Indeed, it alienated quite a lot of people. Well, for some reason or reason, she tired of him. And in so doing, became open to other approaches to which she succumbed. Other lovers came her way. She yielded. and left the home, and left Rosia, and went. How long she was away we don't know, but long enough to have her whole life all wrecked and all ruined. Leaving this broken-hearted man behind, alone. One day, he went out, Sad, heavy at heart, perhaps for some business he took with him a bag, some meal in it. He went through the city, he had to pass the place where slaves were bought and sold, and a sale of slaves was going on. He heard the noise and the bidding and the asking and he looked up and he saw someone being offered for sale. A woman. Something about her made him look again. And as he looked, it was his former wife, emaciated, almost out of recognition, shame, degradation. Was it revulsion that welled up in his soul? No, the old love, the old love came up, overcame everything. And he asked, what price are you asking for? They said, 30 pieces of silver. And he looked in his wallet and only had 15. He gave them the 15 and he said, here's 15 worth of meal, will that do to make up? the 30 pieces. So they said, all right, accept that. He took her home, restored her to her old place of honor and of respect and love and cherished her again. Why must that come into a prophet's life? Sovereignty of God, you say, cruel, hard, bitter. Ah, but you see, a vessel committed to the purpose of God has got to enter into the very heart feelings of God because the prophet had be to become the embodiment of his message. And the message of the prophet was this, Israel, whom I betrothed unto me, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me. Israel, betrothed to the Lord, Married to the Lord, his spouse had forsaken him, had gone after other lovers, been wrecked and ruined in the market. The price, the price of a harlot. And God comes out to an Israel like that, with a new embrace, to bring that Israel back, and to love as before, to restore and honor as before, to pass it over in great forgiveness as though it had never been. That's the grace of God. And the messenger had to embody that message in his own experience. 
Now, that is a very vivid instance, but it's sufficient to carry this point, I'm sure. Ours is not a work and a ministry that is something objective. We are not just tape recorders to reproduce something mechanically. The thing has to be wrought into us and come right out of the brokenness of our own soul. We have to share the passion of God's heart. It's Jeremiah. You're going to turn your back on that? Say, no, that's not for me. But, dear friends, if only we could get a glimpse, I feel, of what that grace will result in. For here in this letter to the Ephesians, you know, that we should be to the glory of his grace, the glory of his grace, what that grace will issue in, in glory, probably more than compensate for all the costs. I've only got halfway through my message for this afternoon. It's so full, this matter of being in fellowship with God. This last emphasis is upon the constituting of a vessel. Note the constituting of a vessel. Jeremiah might well have complained along one line. Perhaps you have, I have, along this line. I was never made for this. No, I was never made for this. My whole constitution and makeup is such that, well, another kind is necessary for this job. For this work. Have you ever said that? Well, I've quarreled with the Lord on that many times. Lord, you've got the wrong man. You've got the wrong kind. It's another type that you need for this job. I'm out of my place. I can do a lot of things very much better naturally than I can do this job. Lord, you've made a mistake. Jeremiah might well have said that. And might have said it not only about his constitution, but about much in his early history. We pointed out, you see, he was a member of a priesthood that had been entirely set aside. His ancestor, the high priest of Abiathar, Abiathar had been caught in complicity with the conspiracy of Adonijah to take the throne from Solomon. And when Solomon was established on the throne, he banished Abiathar, the high priest, to Anathoth. Miles, miles from, the, from Jerusalem. It was a priesthood banished under a ban. Had never been restored. Jeremiah belonged to that ancestry and to that order, banished. He might have quarreled with God over that. The advantages of birth, of ancestry, of heredity, so on, all against him. Now, if, if 
you really wanted the right kind of man, Lord, you, you ought to have got somebody who had better standing than I have. You see? And yet, in the sovereignty of God, this was the man that was chosen, and it says definitely, I formed thee. I formed thee. Mystery, God's ways. But it can, becomes quite clear as you go on through his life that difficult as it was for him naturally, he is the man. He is the man. God can write in this man his own heart. God can come through this man as he might not come through, be able to come through many others. The point is, the man was constituted not as he thought he ought to be, but as God chose that he should be. And being constituted by God, he fulfilled his ministry because God was behind it. God was in it. Dear friends, if you and I are really in line with God and in the hands of God with everything against us in ourselves and outside of ourselves as we think it, as we interpret it, the thing is done sovereignly, the thing is done spontaneously. We put it this way, if you and our I were to assume assume a position to assume it to take it on ourselves and to do it out from ourselves by our own makeup and our own natural equipment if we get into a position that God has not himself sovereignly put, it, put us into the whole thing becomes artificial Unreal. And the evidence to all is God's not in that. God didn't do that. That didn't come from God. That's the man himself. That's the man. He's taken that position. He's trying to do that. Lord is not supporting him. Patent to everybody. When we are in that for which God has called us, and himself, in all the mystery of it, constituted us. The thing is, in a right sense, quite natural. It just does go on, just does happen. You don't have to put on anything, make believe anything. You don't have to adopt a special kind of voice or dress or anything else. It just spontaneously flows, perfectly natural. It just happens. You are, in a right sense, yourself, not aping someone else. God made you for that. He knew what he was doing. You need not worry. Just get on with it, with him. I wonder if that helps you. As you know, there's a lot of unnecessary <coughs> trouble to ourselves and to other people by our getting into something for which the Lord has neither called us nor fitted us. Not according to our ideas of fitness, but his own. Moses, he said, when Moses argued, I cannot speak, I am not eloquent, who made man's tongue? Did you make your tongue, or did I? Jeremiah, I am a child, I cannot speak. Say not, I am a child. Thou shalt go to all that I send thee. Say all that I tell you to say. As you're looking at the clock, how close. If, the point is, if we are with God, God takes the responsibility to see us through. And I bid you, as I have to break off and not continue to finish this, I bid you to go to this book again and see if you can mark these Evidences of God's 
sovereignly at work. There are many of them, but particularly note the tremendous values, resources that there are available when we really are wholly in line with God's purpose. All the resources. The resources. It's a hopelessly inexhaustible realm. We leave it, shall we, for the time.